Uh, so Jeff, I hope you don't mind uh, getting going right out of the gate. Uh, so let me begin maybe with just a super quick overview of this next session. It features a couple of talks that I think are going to take um, a very different perspective. Um, by different, I probably mean kind of taking a step back, maybe discussing some of the fundamentals that might apply in the context of everything that we've talked about uh, this morning. Um, and so the first speaker uh, is Jeff Tsao. Uh, Jeff is a senior scientist uh, here at Sandia National Labs. Uh, he has formerly been uh, leading Sandia's uh, programs with the DOE, Department of Energy, Office of Basic Energy Sciences, Material Sciences and Engineering, and, uh, and has also in, in his uh, time here at Sandia been the chief scientist um, of a DOE Energy Frontier Research Center, or EFRC, on solid state lighting science, um, which you know has contributed to every time you see an LED somewhere within your immediate um, surroundings, uh, at least some of that can be traced back to Jeff and the work that he did. Um, so his uh, areas of research have spanned um, multi-photon spectroscopy, laser chemistry, 3.5 materials, physics, and devices, and then most recently, meta research, uh, which he defines as research into the nature and nurture of techno scientific research. So we've asked Jeff to uh, essentially uh, talk to that subject with an eye towards the topic of this workshop. And I'm very excited to hear what he has to share with us today. So, Jeff, great, great of you to be here. And uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, and thanks for the invitation. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my talk, as Mike said, will be about something that might be called technoscience search, uh, the search for new science and technology, uh, the case study for a search that um, I'll, I'll mainly draw from will be indium gallinitride, the material whose uh, taming in the 1980s led to high efficiency blue light emitting diodes in the 1990s, uh, which led to solid state lighting in the 2000s and which ultimately led to the revolution in the 2010s in how we artificially illuminate the world. Um, I'll mostly talk about how human intelligences did this particular search, search uh, but I think there is opportunity for artificial intelligences to do similar search in the future uh, and for human intelligences to improve how they do such search. Uh, so we'll be emphasizing those aspects of technoscience search that I feel uh, represent interesting opportunities, but, al but also challenges uh, for both human and artificial uh, intelligences, uh, particularly those aspects of search that are of a discovery and surprise nature uh, rather than of a designed and planned uh, nature. Uh, I've organized the talk into three sections. First, I'll define what I mean by technoscience search, uh, organized around something I call the technoscientific method and drawing heavily on a recent rethinking of the nature of technoscientific research articulated uh, in this book illustrated on the right, uh, the Genesis of Technoscientific Revolutions, uh, co-authored with Venki Narayanamurti uh, at Harvard. Uh, second, I'll talk about engineering search, uh, the search for new technologies. Uh, the technologies can be, as they are in the most usual case, designed, uh, making use of knowledge that we know, even if that knowledge is complex and making use of it requires considerable expertise. Uh, the technologies can also have, as they do in less usual cases, an invention and surprise nature, uh, which was the case for in-GAN materials and devices. Uh, third, I'll talk about science search, the search for new science. Uh, science search often begins within itself with a theory or hypothesis that predicts possible facts, uh, the finding or not finding of which would support or unsupport the hypothesis. Uh, but science search can also begin outside of itself with engineering and data. For example, that an engineered form fulfills a function in a particular and perhaps surprising way itself re represents a scientific fact begging for explanation, again, as was the case for in-GAN uh, materials and devices. Okay, so let's start by diving into the techno-scientific method. Uh, many of the ideas on this slide are new, uh, but I think, I hope, you will find the ideas and especially the way they fit together to be reasonable, uh, and in hindsight, after you hear them, uh, perhaps obvious. Uh, there are two main ideas. The first idea is that there are two repositories of technoscientific knowledge, science and technology. The science repository S in blue on the left 
has two bins, both of which will be familiar to you, facts and explanations of those facts. Uh, the technology repository, T in green on the right, also has two bins, human desired functions and forms that fulfill those functions. Uh, as you can see, the two repositories are elegantly symmetric, just as in science explanations exist to explain facts, in technology forms exist to fulfill functions. Uh, the second idea is that the evolution of these two repositories of knowledge is mediated by the technoscientific method. A new phrase that represents the interacting combination of the scientific method, which we call S dot, and the engineering method, which we call T dot. The scientific method on the left starts with S1 dot, the finding of facts, both new facts that go beyond existing theory, as well as new facts intended to test emerging theory. This last piece being, of course, classic hypothesis testing. With facts in hand, the method proce proceeds to S2 dot, the finding of explanations for those facts. This is classic theorizing. And then with emerging explanations in hand, the method proceeds to S3 dot, the generalizing of those explanations to predict possible new facts, triggering a hunt for those new facts, coming full circle back to the half of S1 dot that is hypothesis testing. The engineering method on the right is analogous to the scientific method. The method starts with T1 dot, the finding of human desired functions. Then with functions in hand, the method proceeds to T2 dot, the finding of forms that fulfill those functions. This brings us to the third leg, T3 dot, the co-opting of existing forms to fulfill functions they were not originally intended to fulfill. This we call exacting, a word borrowed from evolutionary biology in which biological forms like dinosaur feathers, which originally fulfilled the function of thermoregulation, are co-opted for other functions like flight. The reason we coined the technoscientific method as a new phrase is because, as we all know, but here we've made explicit, the scientific and engineering methods are not independent of each other. Science can proceed without engineering, and much science does proceed without engineering. Engineering can proceed without science, and much engineering does proceed without science. But science advances much faster when it makes use of engineering, and engineering advances much faster when it makes use of science. Uh, let me mention a couple of additional nuances uh, with, respect, with respect to the science and technology repositories of knowledge and how they evolve. Uh, the first nuance is that facts and explanations of science uh, and the functions and forms of technology can be thought of as forming a loosely modular hierarchy of questions and answers. For example, on the technology side, a function can be thought of as a question uh, looking for answers as forms that fulfill that function. But those answers, those forms can be thought of themselves as, as questions themselves looking for deeper answers. Functioning, functions looking for deeper forms to fulfill them. Uh, an, iPhone, an iPhone, for example, is a form that fulfills the human desired function of portable compute and communications, but it also represents a number of functions that require subforms like Gorilla Glass or integrated circuits to fulfill. And these subforms represent functions that in turn require sub subforms like silicon semiconductor, semiconductor process tricks uh, to fulfill. Likewise, although I don't depict it here, uh, there is a question and answer hierarchy in science. Facts are questions looking for answers as explanations that explain those facts. But those answers, those explanations can be thought of themselves as questions looking for deeper answers, shallower expl explanations looking for even deeper uh, explanations. The second nuance is that the results of any of the mechanisms of the technoscientific method can have various degrees of surprise. The degree to which what you have found is not only something you could not have anticipated, but the reverse of what you might have anticipated. Surprise is important because it is a measure of how much you have learned from what you have found and the less you must have known about the space you were searching. Surprise isn't always important, of course. Most of the time you don't want surprise, so you confine yourself to searching spaces that you know a lot about. But surprise is crucial to invention uh, and discovery. Okay, so let's... Okay, so that was a condensed overview of the technoscientific method. 
Uh, now let's consider engineering search. Illustrated in the table whose rows and columns are organized around the two nuances I had mentioned in the, uh, in the last slide. Uh, let's start with the rows. Uh, on the far left, I depict uh, in blue a modular hierarchy of questions and answers for three five semiconductor materials and devices, of which the prototype is gallium arsenide and its variants aluminum gallium arsenide and indium gallium arsenide. Microelectronic and optoelectronic applications at the top of the hierarchy can be thought of as questions that are answered in part by various system architectures. These system architectures can be thought of in turn as questions that are answered in part by various 3-5 chip packages. These chip packages can be thought of as questions that are answered in part by the chips themselves, of which a key, perhaps the key aspect, is the vertical layering of materials in the chip. And this vertical layering can be thought of as questions that are answered in part by epitaxy, the synthesis process by which the various materials are epitaxially grown as vertical layers. Uh, let me make two points about this hierarchy and use these points to distinguish between the two rows uh, of the table. Uh, the first point is that the different levels of the modular hierarchy represent specialized knowledge and division of labor. Uh, chip architects don't need to be expert at epitaxial synthesis, and experts at epitaxial synthesis don't need to be expert at chip design. Instead, they each can focus on what they do well while passing information back and forth through what can be thought of as protocols. Uh, in the lower left quadrant, I've drawn, I've drawn the layered structure of a so-called vertical cavity surface emitting laser uh, device, as it turns out, that's used in virtual, virtually every computer mouse. Uh, the chip architect can pass the specifications for this enormously complicated layer design to the epitaxial synthesis expert, and the epitaxial synthesis expert can pass the built structure back up to the chip architect. As Herb Simon and Adam Smith independently noted, this kind of modular search is liberating to the evolution of complex systems and complex economies. The second point is that although modularity and strong protocols are liberating, they are also limiting. There are times when, to make progress, concerted change must be made in two or more levels of the hierarchy. In the upper left quadrant, I've drawn a so-called distributed feedback laser, the workhorse device of long-haul fiber optic communications. When, epita when epitaxial synthesis via MOCVD, metal organic chemical vapor deposition, was introduced in the 1980s and 1990s to augment epitaxial synthesis via MBE, molecular beam epitaxy, it was realized that MOCVD has more capability than just growing vertically layered structures. It has the capability to overgrow laterally over existing structures. So chips could combine vertical and lateral epitaxial structures. But in order to pull that off, chip architects and epitaxial synthesis techniques had to undergo concerted evolution. Neither level could be separated from the other by fixed protocols, and we would call what they did a modular co-search. Okay, let's turn now to the columns, for which I borrow language from the classic exploit, explore trade-off uh, in search. On the one hand, in the left column, you want to exploit what you already know. Uh, wherever you are in your search space, you want to be able to make educated guesses about the gradients so you know where to head next. This is where, of course, science can play a key role by helping make those educated guesses. This left column is the home of design, either simple design if your search is modular within a level, or co-design if your search is amodular across levels. On the other hand, in the right column, you also want to explore what you don't know. Here is where there's potential for surprise, of course. And in the seeking of surprise, here is also where contrariness plays a role. When you search where current science might suggest you not search, because perhaps current science isn't correct. This right column is thus the home of invention, either simple invention if your search is modular within a level, or co-invention if your search is amodular across levels. In the 1970s, the invention of the new epitaxial synthesis technique of MBE was a complete surprise. Surface science instrumentation was famously delicate and expensive. So who would have thought it could be turned into a practical, 
rather than what some jokingly said at the time, a megabuck equipment epitaxy technology. And in the 2000s, the co-invention of in-GAN blue LEDs, along with the necessary unconventional MOCVT techniques, was also a complete surprise. Uh, and I'll discuss this uh, more on the next slide. So we have these four different types of engineering search, uh, design, co-design, invention, and co-invention. Uh, my sense uh, is that there has been tremendous progress in making use of AI uh, in design and even co-design. Uh, human and artificial intelligence are both really good when they can exploit what they know. But it is invention and surprise that perhaps represent longer-term opportunities uh, and challenges. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper now into invention and surprise using, again, as a case study, the co-invention of the in-GAN materials and blue LED devices uh, that I'd mentioned on the last slide, uh, and that, as many of you know, resulted in the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physics uh, to Isamu Akasaki, Hiroshi Amano, and Shuji Nakamura. Uh, as background, back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were infrared LEDs and lasers, uh, just not visible LEDs and lasers, or at least not very efficient or bright ones. Uh, but visible light, of course, is desired for many applications, uh, like general illumination, because it matches what the human eye uh, can see. At the time, however, common scientific wisdom was that 3.5 materials were incompatible with the visible LEDs. Instead, it was the 2.6 materials that were favored. Uh, even Sandia at the time had a 2.6 materials research effort. Why were 3.5 materials thought incompatible? Well, for a whole bunch of reasons, but I'll pick out perhaps the two biggest ones. First, gallium nitrate is the only 3,5 material with a band gap that spans the visible, uh, if you include in-GAN alloys. But gallium nitrate cannot be grown from the melt into bools from which single crystal wafers can be sliced, because the vapor pressure of nitrogen over molten gallium is impractically high. So you need to grow GAN, gallium nitrate on some foreign substrate, but all known single crystal foreign substrates have lattice or thermal mismatches with gallium nitride so large that it would seem impossible to grow high quality gallium nitride films on them. Second, despite much effort, no one had ever successfully doped gallium nitride p-type, which you need, of course, if you're going to grow P -injunction, a p-injunction LED. So this was another seeming impossibility. So conventional scientific wisdom was that neither of these was possible, not to mention the intersection of these being possible. Despite this, and despite plenty of ridicule, uh, Akasaki, Amano, and Nakamura went ahead. They had their own informed intuition that disagreed with common wisdom. They were what I like to call, what Venki and I like to call, informed contrarians who trusted themselves and not the crowd. In fact, this is a key route to discovery and invention and surprise. Uh, and to see how here on the right, I've drawn a diagram with two axes. The bottom axis is what common wisdom thinks the utility of a new idea might be. <clears throat> the left axis is, is what the individual researcher thinks the utility of the new idea might be. On the diagram is de de depicted two possibilities. At one extreme is possibility A, in which common wisdom thinks the utility will be high as does the researcher. In this possibility, there's not much opportunity. Even if the researcher is right that the idea will be useful, it won't be surprising to common wisdom because, because common wisdom already thinks it will be useful. At the other extreme is possibility B, in which common wisdom thinks the utility will be low, but the researcher disagrees and thinks it will be high. This is where there is opportunity. It is precisely when the researcher is contrarian and disagrees with common wisdom that there is opportunity for surprise to common wisdom. Why might the researcher disagree? It might be because the researcher has some inside knowledge that gives him or her an unfair advantage over common wisdom. Maybe the researcher has a new tool, a better telescope that common wisdom doesn't know about yet. Or maybe the researcher has thought through the problem more deeply, down to first principles, than common wisdom has. In other words, it is when the researcher is not just a contrarian, but an informed contrarian, where there is the most opportunity for surprise. Any researcher can be contrarian, but not any researcher can be an informed contrarian. So deeply informed 
that there is a decent chance that the researcher is right and common wisdom is wrong. So here is where the opportunity and challenges are great, both for human and artificial intelligences, intelligences. By and large, common wisdom is correct, so we mostly want to make use of it to make educated guesses uh, as to where to search. But we also need to make our own personal evaluations of the degree to which we might disbelieve common wisdom, so we know when it might be leading us astray. This is extremely difficult for human intelligences because we are embedded in a system that rewards conformity. But perhaps there are routes to mitigate this, and perhaps for artificial intelligences, there is a way to structure rewards to artificial agents that balance belief and disbelief in the world of knowledge of the AI collective. Okay, let's shift now from engineering search to science search. Uh, sometimes, as I mentioned, science search leads engineering search. You have a scientific hypothesis to test, and an engineered experiment is the way to test it. Uh, but sometimes, as in this case, science search follows engineering search. In this case, that the blue LED form fulfilled the function of emitting blue light was a scientific fact begging for a scientific explanation. It was especially begging for an explanation because common scientific wisdom had no explanation. It did not even believe it was possible. Let's zero in on just one of those surprising facts that high quality ga gallium nitrate was able to be grown on sapphire. Uh, before Akasaki, Amano, and Nakamura, the typical growth result was this one on the left, uh, films that were extremely rough and defective. After Akasaki, Amano, and Nakamura, the typical gro growth result was this one on the right. Not only that, but there was a very complex and particular sequence of low and high temperature growth, annealing, and growth that was necessary to give this result. So this was the zeroth order scientific fact, one that came out of left field from the world of engineering. What were the subsequent, so now what were the subse subsequent steps leading to the scientific explanation for this fact? Well, first, within a couple of years of their initial success, Akasaki and Amano had guessed an overarching explanation, one in which two things seemed likely to be critical, nuclei orientation and density, and subsequent 2D rather than 3D lateral growth of the nuclei, ultimately, ultimately ending in coalescence. But much less clear were how these were controlled by growth conditions and what was the mechanistic explanation for the narrow and particular sequence of growth conditions that led to good results. So second, lots more experiments were done worldwide. Many from my firsthand observations, not so much to test particular detailed explanations, but to provide but to provide auxiliary facts that might stimulate more detailed explanations. I show on the right one set of experiments. Uh, their motivation, the motivation for these experiments was that perhaps clues to detailed explanations would emerge from knowing the dynamical evolution of morphology en route to the final morphology. That then motivated another question. How might that dynamical evolution be measured? Uh, optical reflectance seemed logical. You can get optical beams into and out of into and out of a gas-filled MOCVD reactor, and at least on certain spatial scales, optical reflectance and scattering was known to be a good measure of surface morphology and roughness. So Jung Han and Bill Brayland at Sandia set out to make these measurements. Uh, what they found is shown on the right. It turns out that severe roughness, as evidenced by a lot of diffuse optical scattering and hence a low specular reflect reflectance, was actually a necessary precursor to eventual smoothness and high material quality. That's this lower curve, very low specular reflectance, followed by a slow recovery to a high specular reflectance correlated with high LED output power from devices made. Uh, from these films. Finally, third, the detailed mechanistic explanation that many folks, including computational simulation folks at Sandia, came up with is ultra-thin film amorphous and polycrystalline growth is followed by grain ripening into optimally sparse, highly oriented nuclei, which in turn is followed by highly anisotropic epitaxial lateral overgrowth and coalescence. That full ex The full explanatory details involves interesting Interestingly, nearly all the important theories and models in crystal growth and thin film growth uh, science. But notice, and this is uh, what I sort of mainly want to point out, is that 
there's a reversal of the usual order of steps in the scientific method. Detailed hypothesis testing doesn't come until the very end. At the beginning comes data and engineering observation. That's followed by an overarching but very sketchy hypothesis, which is then, follow which is then followed by experiments, many of them open-ended and intended to suggest rather than test more detailed hypotheses. Then finally, it all comes together with increasingly detailed explanations and hypotheses increasingly constrained by more and more detailed experiments. And now we see the opportunities and challenges associated with science search by both human and artificial intelligences. Step three, detailed hypothesis testing is the piece we can do reasonably well. But how might human intelligences better do, and how might artificial intelligences, intelligences even begin to do steps one and two? The imagining of the first overarching explanation, and then the imagining and execution of auxiliary experiments that might stimulate more detailed experiments. Okay, one possibility, I don't know, perhaps the only possibility um, is illustrated here. It is somehow making imaginative guesses based on anal analogies with other domains of knowledge. Why might this work? Because as Phil Anderson, the condensed matter theorist who won the 1977 Nobel Prize in Physics famously discussed, all knowledge is interconnected into a seamless web. There's virtually no piece of knowledge that doesn't connect in some way to other pieces of knowledge. And indeed, the more interconnected, the stronger the piece of knowledge is. Maxwell's equations are strong because they connect to so many disparate phenomena. Special relativity is strong because it not only explains the constancy of the speed of light, but also the release of energy during fission and fusion. The laser is a key technology because it not only helps with spectroscopic measurements, but is a key enabler of fiber optic communications. In the case of the scientific explanation for the engineering invention of in-GAN materials and devices, many of the auxiliary experiments were inspired by an analogy to the more general idea that if you wanted to understand how something came to be the way it is, you don't want to just watch its beginning and end points, you want to watch its middle points, how it came to be. Then the final explanation made use of an analogy to how crystal nuclei grow, not just symmetrically in all directions, but potentially asymmetrically, including preferentially laterally. Of course, not all analogies hold, and sometimes they hold partially, but not fully. But somehow connecting to other pieces of the seamless web of knowledge seems necessary. At least that's what human intelligences do. Perhaps there's a way for artificial intelligences, if, even for human intelligences, to make these imaginative leaps without analogy making, but I suspect not. Knowledge builds on knowledge. One has to rely on existing knowledge to create new knowledge. The search space for all knowledge is just too vast. Only by narrowing that search space, by figuring out through analogy where might be the most fruitful to search, uh, can one expect to actually find something useful. Okay, with that, thank you. I, I made it with two minutes to spare. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice work, Jeff. So I, there were some, a couple of questions, maybe one question in the chat. Um, I guess we, I think we have one time for one live question if someone wants to pipe up. Otherwise, I have something I want to ask you, Jeff. Okay, so I'll give you, Jeff, uh, a choice of, let's see if I can maybe give you a choice of three different questions. You pick the one you want to answer. So the first one I put in the chat, which is, do you think that informed contrariness is an area where artificial intelligence algorithms might perhaps uh, be subject to, let's just say, different biases than human scientists might be when looking at the same challenge? So is that a place that might be worth exploring? So that's one question option for you. The second one is, um, I think when you were talking about uh, the gallium nitride story, um, I'm wondering if AI can also be a tool to suggest experimental design and what experiments may be most informative to run next. Uh, and there may be you know, a series of constraints that, that you know, make that an important question to ask. And then the third question that you can choose to answer is, uh, you talked about uh, the value of analogy, how important it is to monitor, not sort of where ideas begin, but how they evolve to reach some kind of an end state. I'm wondering if that is something that might be perhaps uh, observable, uh, looking, say, at, at a corpus of literature in some field, and then 
you know, can the patterns that you may discover of how technology is evolving uh, in past cases where it actually led to some kind of a breakthrough, uh, could monitoring those kinds of patterns in the present perhaps suggest and forecast uh, some interesting outcomes? So anyway, cho choose one out of the three and, and <laughs> do your best to answer it quickly. Okay, I'll choose the first one, but I'll just say that I believe all three. There's There's so much amazing cool like potential opportunity but on the first one um yeah so informed contrariness it's really hard for humans to do that i think we we sort of forget we 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 see past achievements where there was some heroic person who bucked conventional wisdom and all the social pressures associated with bucking uh you know social uh, common common wisdom uh it's artificial intelligences perhaps can be you know to some extent we want them to go along with common wisdom because most most often common wisdom is right but they will they will not perhaps have the same social pressures uh this, that are associated with having to go along with common wisdom. so i feel like artificial artificial intelligence can uh can can jettison some of the baggage <laughs> that we as humans have because we live in a social world and not just an intellectual world. Thank you, Jeff.